Hello everybody, welcome to our Brexit debate. Um, we've got a mixture of panelists today from the in and out parties, um, as well as some industry experts that are going to give their opinions um, and hopefully give you a bit more insight into the way you should vote or the outcome of um, the votes coming up on the 23rd of June. Yeah. 23rd of June. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to give each of the chaps here uh, around 60 seconds to uh, state their case um, on whether they feel in or out is the right way for you to vote. Um, and then we're going to move on to some general topics um, and hopefully won't have to uh, stop a fight. So um, from, uh, from the Britain Stronger in Europe, we have uh, Nigel Griffiths. Uh, from uh, Leave EU, we have Andrew Fraser. Down on the end. Do you want to give a wave, guys? Uh, we have... <laughs> Mike Jones from ASE, uh, Rupert Pontin from, from Glasses, and Nathan Coe from Water Trader. So, welcome to. Is there? I will. Okay, I'll oh, make sorry. sure I sack someone. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So, let's get going. Let's. We can start. Uh, well, let's start at the far end, and uh, your 60 seconds uh, in countdown time starts now. <laughs> I grew up in Britain in the 60s and 70s. Our central na national embarrassment was the chaos and disaster of our car industry. The British car industry was a case for national shame. From 1975, when many of us voted to join the, the then common market and came the European Union, we have seen a transformation. We no longer talk of the British car industry, we talk of the car industry in Britain. It is dominated by foreign investors. Almost 100% of the mass market is, dom is, is owned by foreign companies who have chosen Britain to be the home of their manufacturing across a market of 500 million people. I was proud to serve for six years as Chief Executive for Inward Investment for Britain. During those six years, Inward Investment in Britain more than doubled. 63% of the GDP of this country is foreign owned and those foreign owners are here because they want Britain to be at the heart of the single market. We are now selling nearly three million vehicles a year in Britain. We have one of the most successful car industries in the world. It is intertwined with the European market. To put that at risk is a shameful position to take. This industry is responsible for 4% of our GDP. 49% of the manufacturing in Britain goes to the rest of the EU. We cannot, cannot afford the risk for this industry, for financial services or any other, of cutting ourselves off and being petty nationalists and isolationists. We must stay in. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we're going to hand straight over to Nigel, I think, first, to get your side. Congrats. Congratulations on one of the most successful sectors in this country. You are generating uh, more wealth than the next biggest, the, pet the crude petroleum uh, sector. And with 2.6 million sales last year, 2.7 million this year, you're hitting new records. But at the moment, British business is constrained by Europe, not enhanced by it. And at the moment, we're able to export more easily to the rest of the world than in fact we are to Europe, which is why we've got a £62 billion deficit with the EU, but a £27 billion surplus with the rest of the world. And if we look at the car industry, the notion that there would be any sort of retaliation when on the 24th of June we leave the EU is ludicrous, because while 3 million UK jobs are dependent on our exports to the EU. Five million jobs there are dependent on their imports here. In Germany, for instance, where a million jobs are dependent on their exports, stars, 800,000 in the car sector, 11.2 billion pounds worth of sales of cars here from Germany. Of course, there'll be no retaliation if we decide to leave the EU. Okay, it's Nigel, one of those myths. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, I expect something is equally passionate from you. Uh, I am indeed very, very, very passionate about the motor industry, but I'm passionate from a different way. I've come at this from an agnostic point of view. 
I can give you my thoughts and feedback on all the data that we collect, all the dealers we speak to across the world, on what the implications will be, what they're seeing at the moment on the ground, the day-to-day -day effects of these two standing on television and arguing against each other, and what that's cu currently doing to the consumer, what we think it'll do going forwards, and what we're seeing from a data point of view. I'm agnostic. I'm working out on who's making the most money and how they're going to do it. Thank you very much. Rupert. Yeah, hello there. Um, I sit uh, as Director of Valuations for Glasses, and we sit and report and view what goes on in the marketplace. Um, from the point of view of activity uh, from new car sales, from a used car market, uh, we are currently uh, enjoying a particularly good run. Uh, to leave uh, Europe may be seen to be a poor thing to do, but uh, as a company we sit and we review the marketplace and make uh, judgment on what we see. And Nathan? Yeah, I think auto trade is a marketplace. So I think um, when we look at our customers' manufacturers, the SMMT has said that manufacturers are largely against it. The NFDA have broadly a similar view from their members. So uh, that's definitely the view from that side. I think consumers, from what we're seeing, we spoke to 1,200 of them last week, and 75% said it's not affecting the way they're thinking about buying a car. So I think what we know to be true is that there are more cars coming into this market over the next few years. Brexit's not going to change that. What will give is prices, exactly as Rupert said. So I think we believe either way that we go, dealers can compete. There's still going to be loads of cars sold and loads of opportunity. It may get a bit harder or it may continue to be the buoyant times we have now. So we're, we're agnostic as well. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so the big question uh, for everybody in this room is what effect do you think Brexit is going to have on car sales? Is it going to be a, a negative one or, or a positive one? So, uh, Andrew. Well, first I'd ask the SMMT. 92% of their members think it will be negative. 78% of their members think it will make it harder for them to enter European markets. Now, obviously at local retail, you're in the business of just selling what vehicles are available. But the wider economic confidence factor in the UK and every international body, every UK body, every UK political party, barring the xenophobic UKIP, every UK trade minister of the last 10 years has said that we need to be in the EU. The governor at the Bank of England has talked of it as being an enormous risk factor for our economy generally. The governor of the Bank of Japan has said this is the greatest risk factor currently in the world economy. And it's all very well for the Leave crowd to say it's all going to be all right on the night. And Nigel quotes our, our so-called deficit with the rest of the EU. The rest of the EU is 27 other countries. Only two countries have a surplus with the UK, Germany and the Netherlands. In 1989, when the French tried to impose tariffs on Nissan going into France because they were J Japanese, it was the British government, not the Japanese government, that argued that J Nissan, as a company doing business in Britain, was a British company and had full rights of access. If you think there is going to be no retaliation when Renault come to discuss where the next Nissan investment goes, and we're outside the single market, and there's job in France at stake, you think Sunderland's going to be top of the queue when Renault are making that decision? Sunderland is a fantastic triumph. Nissan produced more cars in Sunderland than Italy produces in a year. Why the hell would we put this at risk? Every national body of repute, every international body, IMF, World Bank, OECD, all of them say there are enormous risks to us coming out. And the Treasury have released an independent study this week, which gives numbers showing how consumer confidence and consumer income in this country will be much reduced. This industry needs confidence. That needs us to stay in. Why give up a market of 500 million people and isolate ourselves as narrow nationalists? It's crazy. Nigel, what's your response to that? Andrew's wrong on Nissan. On the 11th of June last year, Nissan announced £250 million investment and 400 jobs. They repeated that uh, pledge in March, unaffected by uh, Brexit. He's wrong about us having a trade deficit with only two countries. You look at Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, 
all of them send more to us than we send to them. That's why it's a £62 billion deficit. But the most important fact is this. The head of the uh, Remain campaign, Lord Stuart Rose, who headed Marks and Spencers for, I think, 14 years, actually said earlier this year that wages would go up if we left the EU. And given wages will go up, that must be great news for you because that means people will buy more and more cars. That's why the case for leaving the EU is pretty unshakable in this industry. Uh, Mike, uh, do you think uh, the uh, leaving, leaving Europe would see car prices going up? Um, the, the exchange rate is a massive, massive influence in the UK car industry. Um, we know it from living inside it. If the euro rate is over 126, 127, the manufacturers, with the majority of the cars being made in Europe and pumped into the UK, make more money. We see that, that you know, the current situation, with all the, the exchange rate last year, has seen a flood of cars into the UK, helped by China slowing down, helped by Russia slowing down. Southern Europe hasn't recovered yet. We're in a supply push market that is resulting in the registrations, not sales, the registrations that we are seeing at the moment. All I can look at is what's happening to the exchange rate. As people got nervous about Brexit, the, uh, the pound weakened against the euro, we already started to see some car brands reducing supply into the UK. We've seen that start to happen. The last few weeks, on the basis of the bookies taking their odds out to 5 to 1 rather than 3 to 1, we've seen the pound pick up, so it's ne now nearly back at 1.3, or it was yesterday. So looking at car prices, if the euro is, is uh, oh, if sterling is stronger against the euro, the manufacturers can continue with the great consumer offers that we've seen recently. We'll continue to see the cars coming into the UK. We'll see the registrations and, and, uh, and ultimately the sales. Um, the euro rate is absolutely pivotal to what goes on in the UK motor trade. Rupert, have you uh, done any uh, investigations into what Brexit would mean to uh, car values and car sales? Well, first of all, let me say, we've got two really passionate people here, and we've had some fantastic uh, statistics. Um, from uh, our perspective, we, we sit and we look at what's happened with new car sales, and uh, from a new car sales perspective, we've seen uh, ourselves sitting at 4.4% up uh, thus far this year. I think that is probably higher than we expected. It's certainly uh, very much driven by registrations rather than sales, as Mike has said. Um, and I think there's been an element of front-loading of the year by the manufacturers who have who've warned themselves against what may happen around Brexit and the fact that the market would probably tail off if we were to actually see an exit. So uh, from a new car sales perspective, I would actually imagine that the uh, indicators are that sales would decline as we go through to the last part of the year, um, both from the point of view they've done the volume uh, already this year and also from the point of view um, that uh, if it were Brexit, there would be quite a significant difference. Um, we talk about uh, salary uh, increases should we leave. Uh, and essentially that might well be a good thing. Um, but if you then take into consideration the fact that uh, uh, the general public in the face of an exit may well uh, have a lack of confidence in what is going on around them, I think that would probably have a, uh, a negative effect as well. Um, so it's a really difficult thing to uh, comment on. Um, of course, what happens in the new market is, uh, is then reflected within the used marketplace and uh, that's a, a slightly different discussion in itself. And Nathan, uh, what do you think Brexit's going to mean to car sales? Um, I think on, on you, I'd, uh, I think Mike's view uh, makes a lot of sense. I think the one thing that uh, you need to overlay on that is the, the strong sales that we're seeing at the moment is largely, or uh, well, in some large part, driven by accommodating financing um, available to consumers. All these cars are being bought on monthly payments. I think if, if an exit has an impact on those financial markets and they're less, less accommodating in terms of capital flows, that, that is a bit of an uncertainty. On used cars, I think um, our view is a little clearer. We've had um, year after year of record new car sales. They all become used cars over time and they come into the market. Unless uh, the car retailers, dealers are going to leave them sitting on forecourts for longer amounts of time, which is all risk and all depreciation, then I'd argue that I think you'll see used cars continue to march on because they have to. Um, so, Andrew, uh, what's your take on consumer confidence? Well, we've already seen some impact. There was already signs in our economic numbers this year that our, that our growth is slowing. It may puzzle people to discover that the fastest growth economy in the first quarter of this year was the Eurozone. It was ahead of both the UK and the US, and you haven't been able to say that for a while. But I have a 
a genuine question of Nigel, because I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely puzzled. He served in a government with people like Gordon Brown, Alistair Darling, Tony Blair. His own party is passionately supporting staying in. Every other political party, rather than Farage and co, is in favor of staying in. It's a bit like 1975, when the people who, went to, to come, who didn't want us to go into Europe were the loonies on both sides. Enoch Powell stood shoulder to shoulder with Tony Benn against us joining the EU. Uh, you know, as they say in The Tempest, misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. But I've genuinely got a question, of Nigel. Is Gordon Brown wrong, stupid? Is he dishonest? Alistair Darling, the Labour Party, the Bank of England, the Treasury, the OECD, every friendly government across Europe and across the Commonwealth, the Indian government. Modi said the other day, our businesses are in the UK because it's access to the European market. Nigel, why are all these people, these very, very distinguished people and in international and national bodies, why are they all wrong and you're right? Don't you ever, in the quiet of the night, wonder if that is stupefying arrogance? Nigel, over to you. Well, the answer is I don't because I don't get my facts wrong about our balance of trade and you should know better. Because Nigel, we won't minister. discuss numbers. You've had your issues with numbers and the parliamentary commissioner. Let's not go into numbers in too much detail. I, I, I get my numbers right. You got yours wrong. And uh, Gordon Brown, Alistair Darling, the others, yes, they're wrong on this matter. And you're right. And the OECD's wrong. The Bank of England's wrong. The UK Treasury's wrong. The World Bank. The IMF. They're all wrong, except you and Nigel Farage. No, no, they, 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 well, if you look at, uh, at least you're here, Andrew, the leader of the uh, Remain group, uh, Lord Rose, uh, because he says things like wages will go up, that there will be no immediate impact, they don't let him out in the light, they've let you out. Uh, I think Dracula's got more chance of making an appearance than Stuart Rose. Uh, uh, and the, fa the, facts are very, uh, the facts are very simple. Uh, and that is that um, the uh, support for leaving is an overwhelming one if you look at uh, Nissan, if you look at what Toyota are saying in terms of the lack of impact of a Brexit. They've made it very, very clear. And the rest of the panel have made it clear that there's quite a bit of neutrality in this and there are arguments on either side. If, however, you want to pray in aid the IMF, the OECD, and the Treasury, you should look four months before the collapse in 2008, where they were all saying that there was going to be 2% growth. None of them forecast it right four months on, and yet you're taking them at face value for a prediction over the next year or 10 years. Who's wrong there? Uh, Mike, what do you think about consumer confidence? <laughs> what an act to follow. Um, <laughs> From a consumer confidence point, the, the UK consumer has, 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 um, has proved to be phenomenally robust through most things. Interestingly, chatting to um, some of the dealer operators who operate in Scotland, they, see, they saw a fall off in advance of the referendum in Scotland, with the consumers holding off a purchase till they got certainty as to what was going on. We've seen with Volkswagen, we've seen with most things, the consumers bounce back very quickly. Outside of the city of London, um, the car's a necessity which car you have, how old it is, which brand is a choice and a personal choice, but we need cars to get round. The dealer body, the used car market will react to whatever goes on, but uncertainty isn't good for anybody. And that's the situation we're in for just under a month until we actually, uh, we actually get a decision. There's been a small slowdown. Some of that was gonna come out of Q1 anyway. We had a, such a big run at March. People took holidays and a slowdown in April. Lots of cars registered at the month end. Q2's been quieter. Is it down to the referendum or is it just down to the fact we're having a quieter Q2? Uh, I'm not sure. Rupert, what do you think? Well, I think it's very, very difficult to predict what is going to happen and there's an awful lot of feeling between these two gentlemen here. Um, the fact is that there have been a number of predictions that haven't quite gone the way it was expected. So I think it is very difficult to make a firm judgment on what people are, are putting into the press at the moment. 
Um, what I do know um, is that for first quarter, we have had good sales. As I said, I think that was preloaded. Um, uh, I think that uh, uh, as we do with any major event, such as Olympics, major sporting events, the general election last year, we see a turn down in sales. Um, we know that consumer confidence has dipped slightly. Uh, and uh, I expect that whatever happens, we will have a period before the referendum over the next four weeks where things will be quieter. The referendum will happen. We will either exit or we won't. There will be a bounce back. Um, uh, interestingly, when you talk about uh, the, the degree uh, of that bounce back, that, that's, that's the, the really difficult thing. And I'm not sure that any of us here can say with any real certainty what will happen. In terms of used car activity towards the latter part of the year, Nathan uh, talked about an increase in volume from registrations that we've seen in recent, uh, uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, that will mean that used car values are li likely to uh, suffer a little bit anyway, um, where you have more numbers and more choice, and you're bound to see a bit of a downturn. Um, it, the demand uh, will be the driver as to what level those values dip at, because if there is good consumer uh, confidence, good demand, then uh, don't expect values to come down too much. But uh, we're talking about a really, really difficult situation here. Um, and uh, I don't think any of us have got a, uh, an absolute firm idea of where it's going to go. And Nathan, has uh, Australia customers reported any drop in consumer confidence? No, I, I mean, I think there is the, the widely stated general uh, drop in consumer sentiment. But uh, from a car buyer's perspective, when we went out and spoke to car buyers, 75% of them said it's having no impact whatsoever on whether they're going to buy their next car or not. And for the 25% that said that it is, half of them that said they're holding off for a better deal if, we, if there is a Brexit, and the other half said they're holding off because they think they might get a better deal if we, if we, if we stay in. So there's just no consensus there, and we're not seeing that that they're being particularly put off. I imagine on the date or the next day when the result comes out, may, maybe there'll be a shift where, where people start to really question, well, what does this mean? But we're not seeing it really at the moment, not an auto trader. Andrew, um, you've obviously got some very uh, forthright views on the matter. Uh, what would be your uh, reason for the biggest positive for staying in? The biggest positive is that we don't break up a fantastic success story in Britain. The regeneration of the car industry in Britain in the last 30 years, led by foreign investors, and I speak from personal experience, I was never in a meeting with any of those foreign investors or their suppliers without them always talking of the importance of the single market. And remember, only 40%, 41% of the content of British cars is made in Britain at the moment. We have an enormous amount to go for. That is growing. The most positive factor is we don't disrupt politically, economically, socially, culturally, a working marketplace in which we have an inextricable role to play. We've consistently attracted more investment from around the world into Europe than any other country. We are an open, a liberal, a tolerant country. Think of Danny Boyle and the 2012 Olympic ceremony. That's who we represent to the world. That's, who I, that's the sort of country I want my grandchildren to grow up in, open and tolerant and engaging. Yes, 6.8% of our workforce come from the European Union, and aren't we lucky? 100,000 of them work in the National Health Service and in social care. Do you want to send them home? Do you want to send a nurse home because she's not born and bred in Britain and she's from the European Union? The alternative to this positive story and of course there are things that are wrong, and we're outside Schengen, we're outside the Euro, we've renegotiated the relationship between the Eurozone and the EU, so it's a different kind of relationship with Europe moving forward. But my God, this is a wonderful statement about our country, for our children and our grandchildren, that we are part of solving the problems. We are not narrow, xenophobic and isolationist. Let us not go back to the world where Enoch Powell was campaigning in the 1960s and 70s. Please don't let's be narrow-minded. Please keep our United Kingdom together. Because Nigel knows better than anyone that the dangers of Scotland leaving the United Kingdom if we vote to take them out of Europe are very considerable. The implications for the island of Ireland, blessedly now at peace, if we are once again going to impose a physical border through the island of Ireland, overriding the commitments that the government in which Nigel served made over the Northern Ireland peace process. 
We are seeing a period of blessed peace. Do we want to introduce division and isolationism in a country that stands for openness, tolerance, and liberal democracy? Please don't. It's not just economics, but the economics are key, and the economic argument is proven by all reputable bodies and all reputable politicians in this country. Please, let's think of the kind of country we want to be, open and engaged with the world, not queuing up at customs when we try and come back from France. Uh, Nigel, I'm not sure what your policies are on sending nurses home, but um, I am interested to hear what you think of the positives are of leaving the EU. Well, I think the po positives are very uh, clear, and that is that we can decide what uh, rules our parliament makes and our courts enforce. We're not subject to what uh, the Luxembourg unelected judges do or the unelected bureaucrats in Brussels, the self-selecting elite. And also it's a myth to think that you can't trade in Europe unless you're part of the single market. There are 109 countries that don't have free trade agreements with Europe that trade with them. And look at some of the staggering figures. The United States of America, 496,000 million billion euros last year. China, 424 billion euros worth. Even small countries like Algeria, 54 billion pounds worth of uh, euros worth of trade. Or Nigeria, uh, 42 billion. So all these countries are able to trade and to invest uh, here. And it would be a bit more genuine if there were real concerns about Northern Ireland, if the campaign to remain was called United Kingdom in Europe and not Britain in Europe, which excludes Northern Ireland. Um, Mike, what does a positive outcome look like for you on June the 23rd and why? Just looking at the, uh, the, the pure dealer finances and how much we're going to make this uh, money we're going to make this year from a dealer point of view or from a, a, a national sales company, OEM point of view, um, staying in would result in dealers making more profit this year. Uh, it would result in the national sales companies making more profit would this year. It would see more cars flowing into the UK. Uh, no matter on which side, uh, and I've listened to, to both, both here and outside, everybody agrees there would be a short-term dip um, uh, as a result of coming out. There's no agreement whatsoever over what short term is and what the long term looks like. But staying in would result in strong, stronger and more stable dealer profitability as we go through uh, Q2, Q3 and Q4. And clearly from a national sales company point of view, if the exchange rate dives, they will move the cars as elsewhere. They will find somewhere where they can sell them more profitably. We won't hit the 2.6 million registrations. We'll fall back slightly. Um, and as a result, they won't have as much money to throw at, de at customer offers and, and we'll see a drop off in sales as well as registrations. And Rupert, for you, what does, uh, what's a positive outcome look like on June the 23rd? Okay, positives as far as the uh, motor industry are concerned. Uh, if we are uh, going to stay, we're going to see uh, a greater stability of our market sector, whether that be for new car sales or used car sales, I think predominantly for used car sales. So that is the clear positive as far as I'm concerned. Nathan? Um, I think in the short term, clearly, the, the industry is as buoyant as it's ever been. It's great. Uncertainty changes that. I think the nature of the decision, though, is this is a long-term decision for Britain. So making it around short-term um, impacts, I think we need to be careful about that. And from a long-term perspective, my crystal ball just doesn't go out that far. So. Uh, I think it's difficult to call and it's one that needs to be made on a principal basis as opposed to just something that's about the short term impacts. But, but clearly in the short term, it feels like there's some risk to the negative. Okay, clearly some very passionate arguments from both sides there. So I'd like to uh, thank my panel very much. Andrew, Mike, Rupert, Nigel and Nathan, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.